and I pierce through the nose and I try to pierce all the way through for firing purposes but also to help with creating the cavity and I'm getting a little bit distorted for the mouth. So like when I talk about anatomy, we know that the corner of the, right, there's the corner of the pupil, where the pupil is, straight down is the, the corner of the mouth. And I do use that as a reference. Just very gently push up into the edge there. I think about things like the way the, the, the face moves. So there's typically an overlap in this corner of the mouth, right? Because for example, when I talk, my jaw moves down, my head doesn't move up. And so it creates that fold there. Get some cheekbones going there. And so sometimes when I'm working, the head will come right away. This guy is a little bit softer. So I like the clay to stiffen up just a little bit more before I begin to um, sculpt. If it's too soft, I get too much movement because of how thin I'm, I'm working. If it's too stiff, it'll tear. And that's part of where that paper clay comes in hand is it, it's a little bit more resistant you can stretch it and add to it without too much concern of, of cracking. So a lot of this is just supporting the inside of the clay and finding dominant features that I, that I want to emphasize. And part of, you know, this idea is being able to um, build a character through kind of um, dominant features, whatever that might be, right? Like a larger nose, bigger eyebrows, a dominant forehead, whether there's hair or a hat. Like this is that piece neophyte. Uh, and this one I decided to put a hat on. And um, let me cover ears and I'll show you some of the tools I use to create wood texture with. Now, I start with kind of a triangle for ears. And I have to say, when I saw Tip Tolan do ears, I was blown away. I, I should have recorded it. Um, <laughs> I learned ears from one of those NCIS movies where the corner um, reconstructs the, the face on the skull. Yeah. Somebody had told me about the episode, and of course they go from the movie star to these hands that take this triangle and pinch it perfectly into an ear. And so I don't do it perfectly, but um, I think ears are probably my weakest uh, element on the on the head, and um, that's why I pay so much attention to what uh, Tip was doing. But see how it's it's got that C shape. And what I'll do is I'll pinch it really thin and then fold it. And the way they did it on CIS was just amazing. I, was just, <laughs> I don't know who the artist was. And then I'll come over here, right? And um, this is where I will use some of my knowledge of anatomy. And um, one of the things that I've learned about art is if it looks right, it is right. For example, if we look at Michelangelo's David, we can see that the hands are oversized to um, the figure. Now that is intentional to imply youth and strength of this, you know, uh, Israelite king, right? Um, 
And so David has these enlarged hands, but when you look at the sculpture itself, you don't immediately go, oh, those hands are way too big, right? Um, where Michelangelo didn't do that as a mistake, that was something that he did as part of the narrative. And so I think a lot about that, whether I'm executing it successfully or not in my pieces, I think a lot about that kind of stuff when I'm building. I think a lot about um, art that wasn't always measured, right? Um, wasn't measured with calipers as I'm doing it. That is a really good exercise, I feel, but in, in my studio practice, being intuitive, listening to music, responding to um, the clay, like a lot of times, this is so soft, I would actually start another one and then um, let this one stiffen up a little bit and then come back to it. But, um, but anyway, I, I, uh, I do refer back to anatomy and I'll go, okay, right about here. What I'll, one of the things that, um, you know, when we, when we think about an ear, this is a cavity, it's not on the surface. And so when you really start looking at people's ears, they think you, you're weird, but, um, but the, ear, the ear really is this cavity and the earlobe is such this strange transition from the front of the face here. As we come around and wrap around, there's this backside of the ear that we see uh, most generously on bald men typically, right? Mm -hmm. um, like when I'm sitting in the movie theater and I'm sitting behind a bald guy, I just like, oh, that's such an amazing ear. <laughs> you know, I got to re re repeat that. And so Paul's hanging out in the dark places. Theaters. Getting inspiration. Well, Looking I, for bald guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. it, it's funny how your work uh, does it. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, for like when I made pots, it was looking at people's cups, like how some people will have handmade cups and other people will have nothing handmade and they're not interested in the things that potters, that that we so much believe in, in these objects, right? Right. And um, you begin to realize that when you're selling your ware, it's almost like you have to convince people or, they, they call it educate them, but it's almost like you have to convince them that drinking out of handmade objects is worthy, uh, you know, um, rather than that industrial mug. Um, and, uh, but um, it is interesting too, like what people, um, what size people like, like I tend to like small cups. Everybody wants me to make big cups. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's get in here. So I'll begin to remove some clay um, on the inside of this. And then get in here and and score. I hope I'm not taking too long, you guys. Not at all, Paul. Um, look, it's it was it was your hour, so okay. you spend it. You know, we're here till nine. Okay. And we can stay later if you like. <laughs> You want to keep going. <laughs> and, you know, and, and it's always a little comical. Like I, I'll see a lot of Yoda sometimes in the pieces that I make. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, uh, you know, um, some of the, the studying I've done about, you know, dominant, like dominant features, like those who have earlobes that aren't attached as opposed to those who have earlobes yeah. attached. Mm -hmm. um, we want to know what you're sipping tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, I had some coffee, and I have. Some I I don't drink anymore. I have a seizure oh. disorder. Oh gosh! You took that away from me. Um, oh hey, brother in uh, dyslexia, I uh, <laughs> I I had no idea that you also suffered that cruel, unusual. Well, you know nowadays you can get all kinds of great benefits from, from having that. You and I, we had to suffer through the fact that no one knew what the hell it was. Right. Um, and they just assumed you couldn't learn. <laughs> right. I was um, told that trades would be a good area for me. And, <laughs> um, and uh, um, you know, I dreaded spelling tests 
Oh gosh. I even when I start when I started college and they they gave a spelling test, I just it didn't matter. With some words, I just I will always flip yeah. like receive, deceive. Um, don't does <laughs> simple words. Yeah. But uh yeah, in um uh my first year in third grade they uh had tested um I didn't know what the tests were at the time. I was pretty young and my mom explained it to me. She just told me, you're just going to have to try harder. Yeah. That's what she told me. She goes, you're just going to have to try harder. And I have to tell you my second year in third grade was the best third grade I ever had. <laughs> I did second grade. I thought I would never get out of second grade. <laughs> I, I was in second grade for, I don't know. It seemed like forever. Yeah. yeah I didn't know how to read. That's what they uh, what happened is uh, I got in third grade and um, they asked, I remember the, the book they handed me and being quizzed about whether I could read or not. I do remember that. And then uh, that first year in third grade, I spent half the day in second grade doing that over again, right? Um, but I did repeat kindergarten too, and that's the family joke. Uh, I had to do kindergarten twice. <laughs> uh, you know, it was the 70s, right? They were experimenting yeah. on us. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah, see, I was uh, I was much earlier than that. Um, and they were still, you know, dyslexia was just something they were just starting to study. Yes. And, you know, my teachers had no idea. When I, I was in second grade, when I left Arizona, and then I came up here and I did second grade, like I said, you know, I... I don't know when I got out of second grade, but but I remember also very vivid memory of sitting in the reading circle. And, uh, you know, they were asking me to read, you know, read from this book and I'm looking at it and I'm making up shit, you know, <laughs> just like, and the teacher's going, well, where are you, you, you know, you need glasses. You go, you better go see a doctor. Yeah. And uh, so my mom took me to get glasses. I had 20, 20 vision, you know, <laughs> came back and my mom's going, that teacher doesn't know what she's talking about. And I'm thinking, well, you know, it, looking back, it's like, wow, read between the lines. Yeah. Or, um, your son can't read. And you, sh you should know that by now. But I was the youngest. And uh, I think by, by the time it got to me, um, and she just assumed that my sisters would, would probably teach me. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's it. My mom, you know, she had eight kids at home when I was, a, cause I was the youngest too. Yeah. I, I think, you know, the reality is, you know, at the end of the day, you just, I think, you know, how much homework did we really have in first and second grade anyway? But, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, uh, I, um, remember my my design teacher in um at the community college um uh karen mortalero and she um uh told her story about dyslexia um she was in a girls school and they um were they recommended her for uh not an insane asylum but for a special like basically that she was um back then the word was retarded right you sure and um and so here she was here she is a college professor you know um teaching design and her work was all about uh distortion so i don't know if you've probably have seen it where um it'll be like a a sculpture a sculptured a sculpted figure around a chrome post oh yes and in the chrome post, it looks like a real figure. Yes. But the, the sculpture is all distorted. She did work like that. Oh, gosh. And, Unbelievable. Uh, where she's like, okay, I'm dyslexic, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it to work, basically. Yeah. And, wow. um, and uh, she, she was the one where I, I told her, I go, I've, I've never known another te a teacher who nobody's ever said that, right? It was like acknowledgement that... Mm -hmm. Um, and I didn't know that I wanted to teach at that point. I just, um, it was so encouraging. And, uh, um, and uh, but yeah, it's, it's one of those things that 
um, when I got into undergraduate, um, you know, the writing exam you have to take to graduate for undergraduate, um, I was the only um, domestic student in the group because I had to take it so many times. Um, uh, um, my friend Sohe Corita, he's like, how many times have you taken this? Because it was my third time taking the test. <laughs> And, and it was like his third time too, but uh, um, we, we got through it together and we're still working with Clay. <laughs> well, see, that's the one thing is that you learn not to give up. You just keep going until you get it. And that's what you have to do. Exactly. And, um, and so when computers came, computers are linear in the, in the way that they work. And, um, you know, computers were real scary um, when they <laughs> first, you know, I remember my, um, uh, I, you know, I got it, let's see, I think it was a, an iMac or whatever it's called. Um, uh, and it took me forever to figure out all that stuff. And uh, I, you know, I, I learned way much, I, I, I learned, learned way better when somebody sits me down and shows me the path than, exactly. um, than taking a class or something like that. Yeah, I am, I'm that way also. And then you just have to do it over and over. Yeah, yeah, so it's exactly. ingrained. Build those dendrites. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, as a kid, I always made drawings from, uh, from the imagination as well. And so he's kind of done, but it is at this point where I begin to kind of play around as to whether it's gonna be a narrow face or decide to make a pudgy face. Um, one of the reasons most of my work is all stoic, uh, meaning that I don't, you know, don't typically make expressions, um, had to do with learning about the, the representations of rulers and how, uh, you know, back in the day, like, uh, you know, Caesar or any of these people, we wouldn't see, those people didn't see him every day. And so those statues were, were really important to representing who they were. And to have them smiling or to have them angry was, you know, the potential, there's a potential for weakness or instability. They needed people to trust them. And so the stoic face, um, what I've read in, um, and, and actually went to a, a, a talk by one of the psychologists at Green River, he talked about how um, the stoic face is the one we remember because as a species, when we see people, the first thing we say to ourselves is, are you a threat? Mm. And once we determine you're not a threat, you've already told us your name, but I won't remember it because all I was concerned about was whether you're friendly or not. Yeah. Wow. And so, so your name goes right out the window. Um, and anyway, he said that the stoic gaze is one that um, creates um, the most questions. Um, and, and it's been interesting kind of paying attention to that because, um, for example, some cultures don't appreciate the smile in public, mm -hmm. right? If you smile at people, they, they don't, it's considered a weakness or that you're uh, maybe a little bit strange. Um, like, why are you smiling at me? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, and at the same time, uh, that stoic gaze or the rested face, right, um, can scare people, right, in, in the United States. Um, we like a smile in, in this country. Um, and so um, I try to use that stoic gaze and then um, build um, that, that narrative of wear and tear with um, tools that I'll show you in just a minute. So this is just one box. I don't know if you can see this, but this is just one box of all the kind of junk that I collect um, for the potential to embed in my pieces. Um, these are metal scraps that have been found with a metal detector or just collected um, in various places. And um, I usually, the antique nails that are from the 19th century, I do um, put those aside because they're those staple-like nails that have like that flat edge. Mm -hmm. And then, Welcome Nancy. 
Glad you could join us. And then you guys will recognize this stuff. These are just some of the tools that I use to create wood texture with. And, um, you know, uh, these plastic bristle brushes um, work really good when the clay is soft. And when the clay, especially paper clay, once it begins to stiffen up, the metal works really good. The thing about the metal on wet clay is if you begin to use it, it collects so much in the bristles that it's difficult to use. So kind of as I talked about, what I do is identify, now I never, I never begin this when this is this soft, but what I do is identify a, like a split in the wood, right? Something like that. And then I'd take one of these um, plastic tools and begin to just very, gently drag it along the surface to help identify um, basically the wood grain. And you can see how the wood grain, it begins to look combed, of course. I don't know if you guys can really see it's that. It's really difficult to, to yeah. see. Yeah. I can see the, the main uh, The main cut line. that, you, yeah. Yeah. And and so every once in a while I'll come down right next to it and create like a knot, right? Like what we'd see in a tree. And then from here, kind of committed to a knot. But and then One of the great things about these used ones is that they have fewer prongs in them. And so when I drag it along there, I can address just one area and make one area kind of heavier in texture than the other, just like the way a piece of wood would become distressed if it were in nature. And then as, as this dries, I will start to sometimes even stab these because when you look at certain uh, types of wood, whether it's uh, magnolia or um, red alder or maple, um, they split a little bit differently and you can create different patterns um, and or reference um, um, different types of wood. And here I'll, I have a few examples. These are smaller heads, but you can, let's see if I can get the light on this. But you can see with this one here, the, the grooves are cut fairly deep where they actually go through the, the clay wall. Um, it's kind of hard to, can you guys see that? It's, yeah, it's really yeah. difficult. <laughs> He sees you. <laughs> I know it's so hard to, but this one, for example, has, a, I don't know if you can see that has numerous. Yeah. Gases, yeah. It's more like a pattern. Um, but just like with wheel throwing where the wet stage and the trimming stage are really different from one another in terms of working strength and what you can do. Um, with when it comes to creating the wood texture, after I build kind of the basic head, I would come back the next day, create all the details in the face, and then it's probably the next day after that that I begin to dis dear, destroy that, begin to really um, decide on where the main grain is going to be, where a knot might be constructed, and then continue on from there. Mm -hmm. um, all the way to when it is bone dry, what I'll do is I'll spray it with water and get silica sand or beach sand. I, I use all kinds of, you know, like when I go down there to dig clay and kinds of things, I'll collect different kinds of sand and sometimes even volcanic ash and I'll rub it into the clay. Um, and then um, that basically helps it, 
when you spritz it and then you rub sand into it, it smooths it out, but mm -hmm. then it also digs in and sticks to it a little bit. And so some of that you'll lose and some of that sticks. Um, and anyhow, I'll even take a, a calcined um, slip, like basically powdered clay, bisque fire it, and use that to rub into the clay as well. Like if I'm using a, a, a red clay like terracotta, like LFO6 um, powder, if you calcine that would basically means to bisque fire it, right? Sure. You take that stuff and you rub it in there. It, it, it can do some really cool things. Um, especially if you're trying to make something look distressed. <laughs> Essentially, you're, you're trying to destroy what it is you've created to, to give it um, the illusion that it has some history. Right, exactly. And, yeah. So and, how, how is the, the final finish? What, what, are you, uh, what are you using to, once you've, I mean, those are all texture, texturing yeah. aspects. So what, so for the final finish, I spent um, years, actually I spent about a year using, because um, uh, I was using terracotta paper clay, so it seemed pretty natural to use um, underglaze. And underglaze, what I did first was um, painting the, the heads with underglaze and then carving them to try to get it to look like the paint was flaking. And it never quite looked right. Um, and so then I would take underglaze after it was bisque and rub it in and wipe it out, kind of like an iron stain. And then in the second firing, what I'd notice in the exhibit is that it still looked like ceramic. It didn't turn the corner. And in my studio, this was in Seattle, I um, worked, we lived, my, uh, my wife Kristen and I lived in a cottage, a 700 square foot cottage that was like 1909 and it had never been remodeled. This place was wow. haunted, it was old, it was really <laughs> cool. We lived there for six years. My studio was a dugout. It, it had no walls. It had dirt walls that had um, wood paneling around it. And when I first moved into that studio, I had six possums. Uh, as my <laughs> studio mates. You had to evict. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I figured out how to evict the possums, which was good. But um, the, the ceiling was six feet high. So with a light bulb, I would just miss <laughs> the light bulb. So it was perfect for me. But, you know, if somebody like Rob <laughs> Fernell came, <laughs> poor Rob, he'd have to stand like that the whole time. But um, I turned around, I had all this wood stain from doing wood projects. And I just started throwing it on um, the bisque heads that I had. And when I came back the next morning, I thought, that's it. And so I, I went to um, uh, Home Depot and had them mix colors that I wanted. Um, going, look, I, I want, I don't want old English. I want it between this light stain and this dark stain. And, and then I started mixing my own stains, um, because I was just spending extra money having them do it where sure. if I bought and I'd mix them. And then I realized that if I mixed oil base and water base stains, I would get a different effect. I don't recommend that. I actually moved away from oil based stains because, um, the, in the wood grooves, the stain will rest so thick that it would take months to dry. Mm. And so you would smell it. They'd be in the gallery and you could smell <laughs> the stain. <laughs> and, and so I only use water base now. And what I'll do is I'll actually mix um, some clay into the stain. And then I rub it in, I wipe it out. I'll take clay, uh, I'll wear my respirator and I'll take calcined clay and rub the calcine clay into the stain while it's wet so that it looks like that residue that builds up on, um, on driftwood. And, um, and uh, one of the, some of, every once in a while, um, because we live in the Northwest, concrete and, um, doesn't do very well in a bag for very long. But um, what I'll do is I'll take concrete the real fine stuff that costs like twenty dollars a bag. It's a it's a quick crete mix, but they cost twenty bucks, and that's how you 
it's it's the stuff that you can make the bases out of and they look nice and finished um this concrete you can make like countertops out of it mm -hmm. um so i'll take that at that concrete and actually rub it into what i've done and um it it really begins to look like that that kind of caked on limestone sand that would that really gets into the wood um and then i will um stain into that and then when i'm done rubbing in and wiping out because you guys know how stain works where you rub it in wipe it out i'll get in there and i'll paint some areas darker intentionally some areas areas i'll highlight because wiping you know you just keep wiping it away that kind of thing um but Wood stain has worked really well. And then um, I spray lacquer it. And then while that lacquer, before that lacquer sets up, I dust it. I'll put my hands into the uh, dusty clay and I'll rub my hands all over the sticky finish. And it becomes like another layer of goo. Wow. Um, and it's very subtle, but it keeps it from looking too new. Yeah. Um, Sometimes I mess it up, but, um, and sometimes I pr I'll, I'll look at a piece and I'll go, no, I'm not going to go that way with that work. I'll just leave it. Like my last body of work, I didn't even carve um, wood texture in. I just used um, uh, like instant rust is a wonderful mm -hmm. uh, material. A lot of, a lot of people uh, use instant rust these days. Um, instant copper, I, I don't really like that as much as the instant rust. But um, yeah, the um, when it comes to sculpture, all finishes are kind of on the the board. My um, the work that let's see if you can see behind me on the wall right there. Mm -hmm. Those that's white terracage. Um, let's see if I can. So all of these sculptures then are just bisque fired and coal glaze. Yes. Or, yeah. And uh, so this guy is terracotta paper clay with um, with white terracage. Wow. And those, if you guys, um, Ken can tell you, ter making terracage is pretty easy. Um, and what I do is um, I put the terracage on there and just burnish it like crazy, and then um, and then carve into it at, at bone dry and um, and then try to polish it before I leave it. And in this case, in this particular piece, it's terracage and a black stain that I've mixed with. Um, it's a combination of, of the ebony stain and a brown. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not so uh, you tube color like they talk about in painting, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, somebody told me they look, uh, that terracage makes them look cheap but I really like working with terracage. And um, anyhow, um, yeah, so if you look at the back, um, the story is revealed, right? There is <laughs> the, the terracotta paper clay. And I drill, um, my hanging system's real simple. Um, whenever somebody goes, how do I hang it? You just put a nail in a stud and you're good. <laughs> <laughs> which causes some problems with galleries that don't have studs. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, but anyway, um, the back is um, be done very simple. Yeah. What's, um, what's the name of that piece? Um, Weatherman. Nice. Weatherman, um, uh, in, in reference to like uh, a fisherman, right? Mm -hmm. um, not weatherman, but like somebody who's... Who's weather. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, I, I, I like that you asked about title because one of the things that happens, whoops, <laughs> it's what happens when you clean your studio. <laughs> um, one of the things that happens, um, like this guy, uh, Neophyte, his name's stuck, but I've actually shown work and realized that those titles aren't the right titles. Oh. and uh, have renamed pieces. Um, uh, I don't know if that's the nature of figurative work, but it's, I think it's the downside of working right to a deadline where 
all of a sudden you got to come up with titles and prices and all this business stuff that we're not it's right it's not <laughs> it's not right brain stuff it's the last thing you want to do yeah definitely. you just want to make work yeah, exactly and, yeah. exactly I'm, I'm curious how much time you have into a, a work like neophyte how many hours Wow. Um, you know, that's really hard to say because I always build uh, multiple heads at the same time. Oh, okay. But from beginning to end, um, I, if I, because because of my family schedule and work schedule too, um, and I call it, so coming from the Southwest, I call the Northwest to clay people, it's Northwest never dry, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, like I'll come back in the studio expecting to trim or, or work on a piece and I won't drive. But um, honestly, um, yeah, because what I did with this piece was it, it had the shoulders. Mm -hmm. um, here, let me. It's, it's really odd because everything further back is like posturized. It's like two or three values is all. Oh, wow. It's interesting, but. I know these are extremely detailed pieces, so. Yeah. I'm yeah. looking them up online. They look so cool. They're oh. so cool. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, good job. But yeah, like this one, you know, I, I built this fairly thick and cut into it and then lifted the clay off. And the way paper clay is, it's a little bit like wood where if you cut it here and jab it here, it's going to come right off there you know, like, like the way wood grain would work. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say, you know, a good, you know, week and a half before I decide something's done and then I fire it. And I think the tension, like this one had nails in it and everything, but the tension really begins with the finishing, uh, deciding I've made some severe mistakes, like putting white stain on first, mm -hmm. um, with some pieces and have it work and other pieces like, Oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that. And then try to hide that with dark stain and, and they get so full of stain. Um, it actually starts to flake off. Oh. Um, um, I've, I've taken the wire brush back to them to try to erase a lot of that. Um, but then um, the finishing with the stain, uh, maybe, it, it takes like a night because I'll start with the stain wiping in, wiping out. And because I will rub things into the stain while it's still wet, mm -hmm. I will, um, um, I will continue. Whoops. Whoa. <laughs> you okay? I thought, yeah. I thought that was me. Man, man down. I, yeah. one one. I thought I fell. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Ah. We, we were all bracing. <laughs> Earthquake. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, so usually one night just to finish it and then I'll come back in the morning and um, I might spray, like when I spray the lacquer on, I'll be like 20 inches away where it's just like getting the mist to cover it. So it's not, uh, um, so it doesn't look like it's been sprayed essentially. But, um, and other pieces just take forever if, if they're just not going right. Um, and some pieces just go back to the fence and get hung in the backyard. <laughs> <laughs> I have plenty of those. But <laughs> and, one, and one of the things that I discovered about paper clay is that it is not sensitive to freezing. Mm -hmm. If fired to cone 04, it has to be fired to 04 or higher. Um, I shouldn't say higher because I haven't tried it at cone 1. But I have pieces that have been in my backyard for um, since we moved here in 05, and they have not cracked, split, flaked, or anything. With all, and we live in the Renton Highlands where it snows at least a few times a year. And um, I have um, these big crow plates uh, hung around the backyard, and I and I wouldn't hang those plates out in the backyard if I thought that they it would destroy them. And um, there, I think, I don't know the science behind it, but I have a feeling it has something to do with the paper because the terracotta pieces um, that I've um, 
built that don't have paper have flaked. Mm. Where mm. the paper clay ones, um, and I should say tend not to because I do have one that shows flaking, but that one has terracidge on it. Oh. Um, and I think maybe the water's getting underneath the terracidge, but it's not falling apart like people talk about with terracotta yeah. outdoors. And um, that's a really unusual observation. I that I would be interested in the science behind that. Yeah. Because you would think, I mean, at O4, it's still very absorbent. Yeah. If it's absorbing water and you have freezing going on, you would think, how is this clay is like elastic, at, you know, in a ceramic state? Right. And very odd. So, I wonder if it has something to do with it being paper clay, possibly something to do with having wood stain on it as well. Um, uh, but I, anyway, it's, it's one of those things I have, if it were daytime, I'd take you guys out there and show, <laughs> show you these pieces that have just been hung on the stump for um, forever. And well, we, we did, you did open up with a shot, a lot of snow, or we saw your studio. Yeah. Um, Lots of snow on the ground and yeah, yeah, but uh, but yeah, and that was just the other was that last year I think, but because uh, it it was last year or the year before we had that really good snow. I think two years we had a really big one. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's what. It, yeah, because we had some great time sledding around here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the, one of the only dads that enjoy, still enjoys it. You're such a kid. <laughs> That's great. But, uh, but yeah, any, do you guys have any questions? Like, uh, what are some of the things that you guys are working on? I have a question. When you mentioned day one, day two, day three, as far as like when you work on it, are you covering it up in between or is that like letting it dry in that pace? Yeah, so for example, um, with, with today being a little bit warm, I would cover just the top of this. Um, <laughs> If it were a rainy day, I would um, I would probably just leave it uncovered because it's about what it's eight o'clock, right? And so I just leave it uncovered because it's Northwest Never Dry, all right? And and in um, where where the back of my yard faces south, um, and so things dry pretty slow. But if um, if I left this like like this tonight this would be too stiff to really work. You know, I'd lose that plasticity. Yeah. And so I would cover, you know, the majority of this and maybe the ears because like these ears would need um, some work too still. Um, Thanks. That's a good question. I always tell people to err on the wet side um, and cover your work because, you know, clay, once it's, once it's stiffened, um, those platelets don't like to be rehydrated. They start you know, falling apart and losing strength. Yeah. Um, and that's where cracking comes in. You know, a lot of my work is distressed. So if things go south, sometimes I can fake it. <laughs> you know? I oh, it. yeah. I meant to lose that ear. <laughs> nice. But yeah, I always err on the, on covering your work. Um, but if I know, like, I'm going to be in here tomorrow morning, I just cover the top. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. That's a good question because in your studios, it's really important to, to, um, to be connected to the environment. Like in the classroom uh, at school, that's a fake environment where the rooms are heated at 68 degrees or something. So things dry if they don't get covered. And um, in fact, they dry faster in the winter than they do the summer with the AC on. Right. Um, and so um I, and in the different places that i've worked here in the northwest some you know you got to watch out for those heaters that blow on the work yeah that's, that's the worst for pottery especially lidded vessels <laughs> they, warp. Yeah, warp, or, warp, big, warp. or big pots you know yeah. um when you're making big pots if the wind gets on one side of those pots <laughs> they, you, there's no standing them back up straight really I meant to do that. That's my style. Uh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's 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 one of those things. I um I try to 
could, you know, I try to explain to my students, especially their first quarter, that the hardest thing is to get a sense of the tempo in terms of drying and, and essentially to err on the wet side. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, so Paul, uh, obviously, um, there are still galleries showing is, uh, I am gallery still carrying your work and yeah, gallery IMA. In fact, I was scheduled for October and because of, of life, um, stuff I had to, um, right. I had to cancel on that, but, um, usually I do a, a um, usually it's a three person exhibit or a group exhibition that I'm in every year. Um, they usually show some of my work in December for the, what they call the holiday show, um, which lasts through January. Um, and at this point, you know, with COVID, I honestly am just hoping that galleries will still be there. Um, after all this. Yeah. Well, uh, we saw what happened in 2008. I mean, galleries closed left and right. Yeah. Um, that just took the, the gust out of everything. Yeah. Um, so yeah, hopefully, you know, we'll have places to show and yeah. Um, a lot of people are doing online sales. I, I've not really entered that arena but yeah. I'm not really producing much work these days either. So, well, and, and for myself, you know, um, I guess I could buy a cup online, but I really like to hold the cup in my hand before I buy it. Yeah. Um, and some of that has to do with my economic status, you know, 50 bucks is a lot for a cup for, you know, and you know, cups these days, uh, are easily a hundred bucks. Right. Yeah. And, and so I want to hold that thing. I want to cuddle it at least for a few minutes before I, before I, I hear I that money over. But um, yeah, you know, Pioneer Square really took a hit uh, in the recession back in '09, and uh, you know, I don't know that it ever really bounced back. Um, we had such great momentum with some of the developing that I have mixed feelings about in Pioneer Square because it's a historic area, we kind of want it to remain that way. But um, it just seemed like there was more action happening, um, e you know, with each year. Um, and uh, uh, then COVID hit, right? And um, uh, three-dimensional work, I, um, yeah, I'm an advocate that you need to experience it in person, right? Um, you need to see it in the round and um, uh, which is why I, I think going to museums is so important, right? And, and galleries, but, uh, and I don't mean to say that you understand everything about a painting just by seeing it online because painting's the same way. There's, you know, oil painting, the scale, the way light hits, hits it. Um, all of those things are, are um, sensitive to the way it really is um and uh but yeah i'm still at gallery ima and uh young sheng who owns the gallery uh it sounds like she's doing fine so great um i know she was in korea for a while um i think a lot of people went home when things got really uh scary you know it's still really scary i think it is we're just getting used to it a little bit, I think. Well, unfortunately, maybe some people are getting a little too used to it because things are starting to flare right. up again. That's okay. Um, we just get a whole new layer of another scary. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this has got to this has got to turn around. Yeah. Well, well, and I'm I am on mark. Well, I shouldn't say on mark. I made a proposal for spring quarter to come back teaching pottery one pottery class that would be half full. Mm -hmm. um, I think we could pull that off in our studio, um, but all the protocols have to be in place. And, and yeah, I, I, think, I think Americans need, need a little lesson in, in, uh, in collective thinking. Yeah, you know. <laughs> well, it's been pretty, pretty squashed in all of us for a while. <laughs> yeah. So right now, uh, 
no one is allowed on Green River. Is that is that right? Right. Uh, we had to, uh, in order for faculty to go on campus, we have to take uh, 10, 10 exams. So you can imagine being dyslexic. It's thank goodness I could retake those exams multiple times because they're all multiple choice. <laughs> they don't accept written answers. <laughs> oh, jeez. But, uh, but yeah, we had to take uh, a question, um, take these exams uh, about COVID and PPE and everything. And then we have to take an at a station where uh, what is our temperature and all that stuff. And then we have to get Dean's approval um, so that they can track, trace us. Um, so I have to say like, I'm going to go to my office, go to the mail room, be in Salish Hall, go to Pottery Studio, and I'll be there two hours. And then that way they can clean behind you basically. Mm -hmm. And so, wow. um, initially when, when a lot of our, our pottery friends, uh, like Marie Weichman and Lisa Conway were coming up with, uh, uh, ways of teaching ceramics um, online, I, I was commending them. I thought, okay, we can do this. Um, and then I talked to my dean. She goes, we don't, want, we don't want you on campus, and we don't want students coming to campus to drop off their work. And so I, uh, I thought, well, I'm, I'm teaching Art 100. I, I enjoy it. Um, and so, and it gives me more studio time, I guess. So, um, yeah, you know, we were spending a lot more time at home these days. <laughs> yeah, that's a fact. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. not a bad thing for, uh, you know, an, an artist. That's for sure. Yeah, you know, it's um, what I found. I was off social media for a month, and I, I found that that really helped my state of mind. Um, uh, I, so I'm thinking a lot about that right now even though it's kind of good to be back and see everybody again, uh, you know, on Facebook and Instagram. Um, it, it was nice to take a break. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I got reading done. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. So you just deliberately decided you wanted to do that? Yeah. What, it, well, what had happened is I, uh, my father passed away um, in August and um I just felt like there was so much noise in my head that um, I thought, okay, I, I'm just, I'm just going to take a break. And, and, uh, but I've done it. I usually do it when I go out to visit my parents where they live, you can't get internet um, uh, or now they get it, but it's so unreliable. It's like, why bother? Yeah. Um, Cause it's so slow. And um, I always feel so good. Out there, you know? <laughs> You know, they live out in the high desert in the Owens Valley near Mammoth. Oh, right. And I just love walking around the desert. There's archaeological sites where um, the ancient Paiutes uh, created petroglyphs. And I just, you know, that's part of this research. So like the ancient Paiutes made pottery, um, but very, very little. They, they just found basketry to be the way um, to work. And they, they created these amazing bottles out of bottle shaped baskets they're so beautiful and they covered them with um pinion pie sap uh mm. to make them watertight wow. and um you know at the museum i'm just looking at how tightly wound those reeds are anyway it's i was like do you know how many coil pots you could probably make <laughs> <laughs> but they didn't they weren't nearly as fragile yeah. or as heavy exactly <laughs> and and what's interesting is the women that these would be for water, the, the, the bottles, right, um, would be primarily for water. And the way the women carried them was with a strap around their forehead down on their back, very similar to the way Inca carried mm -hmm. their chichu, chicha vessels, right, um, around strap around their head. And anyway, it's, it's, you know, kind of connecting the dots of that, that northern migration that may... Um, be who the ancient Paiutes are. Um, we don't really know, right? Um, but, but yeah, the the vessels, the the design of the shape, one would think that that was maybe was influenced from China or something. The way the shape of the bottle is, I can send you an image. Uh, um, <clears throat> can I can send you an image of one of the, of 
of some of the photos that I, I took in the museum. Uh-huh. But they're, they're really, um, really amazing um, forms. I, I visited, uh, I visited uh, Bampao along the uh, Yellow River in China uh, and uh, archaeological site. And when we first went in and started seeing these incredible plates, they looked like the uh, Southwest, uh, the Membre could have made these pieces. Uh, they also had pierces, uh, geometric designs. Wow. I mean, it was, it was so uncanny. I mean, we all were looking at each other going, this is, wait a minute, what, you you know, so, yeah, how, how does that happen? Yeah. Um, the information had to have been transferred somehow. I don't, yeah. I don't know. And, it just and blows there's, my mind. It, it, me too. I, I'm, um, when, when you look at ancient pottery from, from China, or what is China today, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, because when those pots, some of those pots were created, uh, China wasn't called China then. Um, and those designs and patterns, there's something human. I think that that's, I think, you know, and it's, this is completely anecdotal, but I think there's something really human about um, the way we pattern things and uh, the way we resolve, we, we resolve like, okay, drink from drinking out of the hand to drinking out of a cup to putting a handle on it. Um, right. Um, uh, even to uh, practices of cooking. Um, but there are a lot of, con- you know, there are connections made when you look at like the, um, the Jamon pottery, um, there are connections to South American styles. Um, I, I think I want to say it's um, maybe Bolivian. I'd have to look it up. But there, these, these archaeologists, archaeolo- uh, the archaeologists that were working on this, um, tying the two styles together from uh, southern Japan to um, what would be Northwest South America. Um, that was in the 1940s, and their research really didn't go much further after that. Um, and but the styles are just uncannily near one another. Huh. How, uh, so what what period of the Jamon? Because um, oh, it's it's late for Jamon, but early okay. for for South America. Wow. Um, yeah. Huh. So yeah. so incredible. It is, and it it all has to do with the the kind of rope like patterns in the pottery. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and they don't when you see them in South America, you don't really make the connection right away. But when they when they start overlapping some of the pots, uh, you start seeing that connection, kind of like the membrus with the kill hole, you know, um, you know. Yeah. That, that's happening on the other side of the world is well, crazy. Yeah, and, and those pots were eight, nine thousand years old. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's just sorry, I just had to check. Yeah. Make sure that uh it wasn't my alarm that was going off. I thought <laughs> I might have set off my uh my car with my keys somehow. <laughs> what's what's the Peruvian era that you were comparing to Jemon? I'd have to look it up. I could look it up for you guys though. <laughs> Paul, you, you're amazing. You have shared so much with us this evening. Uh, I feel like we're taking advantage of, of your time here. Um, for your, your <laughs> well, well, those those ties that we're talking about, I think that's what's happening is uh, information is so accessible today. We begin to go, well, look at this. Well, look at that. And, and one of the things that I've learned from my aunt, who's a linguist, is that some of those connections are real, and they consider them real because um, they exist linguistically as well. Yeah. Um, and the linguistic ties are more reliable than some of the artistic styles. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, like when we look at the Ring of Fire, and we look at the way that uh, um, the the people that live in the the, the edge of the Pacific they have very similar ways of spilling space on surfaces from uh, from the New Zealanders to the Pacific Northwest to the Chinese um, to the South Americans. They tend to fill the space, right? 
um, in a in a in a pattern called form line design, and form line design can be applied to Maori um, totems and their mm -hmm. houses and stuff, and um, and of course all of them were seafaring people, and uh, um, yeah, it's pretty pretty interesting. I um, because of where I grew up in Southern California, um, I looked at the Shumash people a lot because the Shumash people have the same way of constructing boats as Polynesians. Mm -hmm. Their word for boat and fish hook, and they have a number of words that are the same word, oh, cool. um, spelt differently, of course, mm -hmm. but the, the enunciation is the same. And, um, and anyhow, it's just incredible. I, you know, it just speaks to how we really are one family mm -hmm. um, yeah. in terms of humans. Yeah. But, I, uh, I think that there was a period of time that we haven't discovered that there was like tr teletransport was was a thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. It's just uh, it's just so crazy that, you know, that on one side of the world, something could be done in the same fashion on the other side of the world at the same time. I mean, we, we see it. We, I mean, we make discoveries um, just regionally. Um, you'll see, you'll see similar things happening. Um, but it just, yeah, I don't know. I, I guess it just goes to show that we are all human and we are connected and, you know, color of our skin doesn't make any difference. Right. We, and one of the, and one of the things um, I was going to say about art making is that when a lot you'll hear a lot in art like oh their work looks like this person's or it's derivative work try to get that out of out of your head it's hard even for me um, there's a lot of figurative artists out there and um, we all just need to make yeah. Um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll cross these lines with people. You know, I've, I've had people saying, Oh, you, you, your pots look like so-and-so's pots. And I'm like, Oh, that's great. You know, yeah. I mean, <laughs> even I've never met them or seen their work. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, and then admittedly, you know, like Frank Boyden and Tom Coleman and, and uh, you know, those, those, a lot of those potters who, who make classic forms, like, like, uh, like Ken Turner, <laughs> you, know? Like, you know, I knew the work before I knew the potter, um, you know, you know, making these round, these round shapes and, and, you know, finding the beauty in that curve is something that doesn't happen with every pot. And, and um, not all potters are, are interested in that. Right. Yeah. Um, and uh, you were going to tell us about that pot that you just had your hands on. Oh That's yeah. Right. That's right. You were. So this this was uh one of the um pots that was um part of that investigation of the ancient Cherokee designs and um and shape. So this was in that experimental firing, but this was a high fire clay uh mm -hmm. fire to cone O2. And it's vitreous because of the amount of reduction. So I I over reduced it. I reduced that kiln so hard. I, I blistered that terracotta. Like, like, like I knew it would blister, but I would hope it didn't, right? And the reason is, is that long ago, I did a firing. We used to, at Long Beach, they didn't allow us to fire the electric kilns at Cal State Long Beach unless we were doing low fire glaze firings. They didn't allow us to bisque in electric kilns. This is so that students learn how to bisque and how to fire kiln. So we were, during our glaze calculation class, doing 04 reduction firings and cone 9 reduction firings uh, with our glazes that we were experimenting with. And I had done this uh, 04 reduction firing with clear glaze on terracotta, and um, I had thrown the pots really thin, and the, the observation was that the clay s seemed as vitreous as porcelain. And so I've all, ever since I worked with uh, translucent porcelain too, back this is, I haven't worked with it since I was at Long Beach, but there's this place where 
where clay just about fails, where it does something that it doesn't do anywhere else. And I think people who would fire are totally into that, right? Mm -hmm. they, they push that clay, and they push it and push it. And the thing is, I'm not big on grinding. And, <laughs> and, and <laughs> wood firing is a commitment, right? Yes, um, it is. I think if I was, uh, if I was single and I didn't, you know, I would do maybe wood firing, but I, I love pit firing and, and salt firing's similar, except it doesn't take as long. But pushing these clays to their limit is something that I was interested in. But that's really that, where that came from. And one of the things that I'm trying to investigate is when, uh, so within the Cherokee tribe, because I'm a tribal member, I see a lot of, uh, I'm what's called a, an at-large member. And honestly, I didn't grow up Cherokee. I grew up Southern Californian, right? And so I don't know my traditions and stuff. And so I asked my cousin, what does this mean? What does that symbol mean? And I, I get these kind of ambiguous answers, right? Um, and so that's some of what I'm kind of looking for is trying to understand what some of these, um, these patterns mean to um, not only Cherokee, but maybe some of the other... Um, uh, surrounding tribes because Cherokee is a name of a people who were derivative from uh, Mississippian culture, right? Mm -hmm. So when places like Cahokia dispersed, well, many of the tribes we know today are those um, descendants. And um, so, you know, we never met the mound builders or who lived at Cahokia, right? Because they were gone by the time Europeans got there. Um, but uh, the through archaeological evidence and through um, uh, oral tradition, um, it's believed that um, Cherokees are connected to the Iroquois and the Northern Woodland people, which would be Cahokia Mound, which was a huge population. Um, you know, somewhere, I forget how many thousands of people live there, um, but it was massive. And, um, and so the pottery uh, and the symbolism that you see on the pottery as we get down to the Carolinas where the Cherokee are known to live, some of their uh, patterns and symbols are very Mayan looking. Mm -hmm. And of course we do think that the Mayan, you know, went around the Gulf up, up north um, looking for different resources because as they grew in population, um, their resources were being depleted as well. And, um, and so, Anyhow, there's all, you know, the picture just keeps growing. <laughs> and, and that's why I kind of stuck with like looking at cultures that aren't known for clay and seeing what kind of clay work they did. And the investigation includes, includes housing and diet as well as medicinal. Um, a lot of people ate clay for medicinal purposes. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course it's a, um, it, uh, um, it's a natural, uh, oh, one of what's Kale it called? pectate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it cleans you out. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, anyhow, it's, it's interesting to, um, uh, look at the, how material cultures decided to use different materials. And, um, uh, one of the things that clay is tied to um, as a ceramic material is fire. And um, I don't know if you guys remember, but I think it was in 2016, there was a ceramics monthly that was published and they had found a biologist in China had found um, five pottery shards that carbon dated to about uh, 17,000 uh, BCE, which that basically means those pottery shards are like 20,000 years yeah. old. Yeah. And there was, there was a, there was a cave, wasn't it found in a cave? Yeah. Yeah. And it had been excavated by many archaeologists, but they never found those. And here this biologist was excavating, doing research um, on something else. And she finds these shards, tests them, and they turn out to be so ancient. And what's mind-blowing about that is it demonstrates how hunters and gatherers and migrating peoples created pottery. Um, even though you might, you know, in the summer live up north and, and move south for the winter, you might have pots buried in both places um, 
or or stuck in a cave um, so that when you return there for that season, be it um, winter or summer, your pots would still be there. Mm -hmm. And it demonstrates that the idea that that pottery doesn't really develop until uh, we become sedentary with um, agriculture and the domestication of animals, um, it demonstrates that pottery does precede um, these ideas of, of pottery. Civilization. Right, right. Yeah. Um, and I, I just love that. I love not knowing to some degree. <laughs> right? and, I, and I love the way that that opens up the understanding of, of how people related to our landscape. And, and of course, this is all tied into um, pottery um for for us for me yeah sure absolutely because then i want to know what they're cooking right <laughs> well <laughs> if i come over <laughs> didn't they determine that uh that they there was like uh, some kind of fish stew or yes or um and, and beer yes and they I were brewing so. beer yes uh, yeah. yeah yeah the I, fermented drink yeah oh I mean, it's, it, it's amazing that, you know, I mean, we wouldn't know any of this without ceramics. Right. So. And, and that's just the thing is I, when, when I tell the students that their cups that they make in this class will last longer than the Golden Gate Bridge, <laughs> I ask them, do you, have you ever seen a sword that's 20,000 years old? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, um, and it's incredible, right? Because there's no way that those could have been the first pots. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because because of how well made they were. Yeah, Pretty they were incredible. Thin, you know what I mean? They were thin and. Well, yeah. I yeah. mean, it, you know, none of us made the perfect first piece, right? <laughs> yep. <laughs> we all had to work on it a bit. Yeah. So it's interesting. Yeah. Because. Uh, you wonder, well, okay, so what are the conditions like at that time period um, right. that these people who are hunter-gatherers actually had time to make a piece of pottery, yeah. you know? Yeah. Huh. yeah. I know. I know. I When I think of Jamon, uh, you know, what I read about Jamon, it's like here you have a, a, a culture that's not really into agriculture, and yet they made that time to make these beautiful pots. Yeah. And so yeah. I'm like, that's Shangri-La right there. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And, and what I have read about that, and, and I'm, I'm referring to middle uh, shaman period, yeah. is that, that it was absolutely a time where food was plentiful. I mean, you know, either, either down uh, by the ocean, they could, they could get fish or up in the mountains. It was cool. And there were plenty of berries and, uh, you know, there it, things to hunt. I mean, it was just, um, it wasn't hard and there was no war, you yeah. know, people were not fighting one another for resources because there were plenty of them. So they had time to, to make these incredibly elaborate pieces. I know. And they're, they're just amazing. I, I wish I could uh, get to Japan to see uh, them in the museum there. I've, I've only seen, I think they have two or three of them at, at LA County Art yeah. Museum that I've seen. Yeah, I've um, seen those pieces. Those are some of the only pieces that I've seen. Yeah, um, yeah just yeah. amazing. And, uh, but yeah, it's, um, it's the, that's a, what I, you know, what I often talk about is the history of clay is the history of, of us. Um, mm -hmm. Because even the caves of Lascaux have, there's a particular cave that has um, a bison uh, formed out of clay um, on the floor of the cave. Um, and it's not tempered or anything, it's just built in the cave. And that they, dates back anywhere between 25,000 and like 37,000 years ago. Yeah, wild. And, uh, and and that's just mind blowing. I mean, we it's hard to understand that kind of, like that span of time, and uh, and what that was for. But we do know that securing food supply and procreation was so important as it is today, right? That we celebrate it in our art, and we see that in our art today, right? We see um, if you go to most kitchens, they'll have art that represents what they eat, 
uh, whether it be a pig or a cow or a radish, <laughs> you know, uh, somewhere, even if it's on a, on a hot pad, um, you know, um, sure. and, uh, and, you know, we all love babies. They're so cute, you know, <laughs> uh, and it, and it, and even with all of the, the medical knowledge we have, it's such a miracle, a miracle to see it happen. You know, it's like, oh my gosh. Right. Um, and, uh, only uh, those that go through it know, and that's kind of a conceited statement, but I had no idea about my parents until I became a parent. Uh, you know, I told my mom, yeah. I go, I can't believe my mom went through that nine times, right? <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Different day, different, yeah. different world. Wow. Yeah. I was just like, holy, holy crap. <laughs> 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 I'm yeah. glad I was the youngest. <laughs> oh God. Anyway, but uh, my my grandmother says it's all the same after two. <laughs> <laughs> she had eight boys. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I know my mom said after three, the fourth one begin by you get the fourth, the the oldest one starts to help and it gets a lot easier. And it's yeah. Yeah, I, I remember growing up with at least two mothers. I had three older sisters, but, you know, my mom and then my oldest sister was, they were, they were both mother figures and took it very seriously. Yeah. Um, but uh, interesting. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it is. Oh, gosh. Well, listen, Paul, again, um, God, you've been so gracious to spend all this time with us. Um, no problem. I, I'm. I'm just so thankful, and it's really been a wonderful um, evening. I don't know if anyone has anything else to ask Paul while we got him here, but. Yeah, uh, I have a technical question. Um, sure. When I'm looking at the two heads behind you, when you take it off of the, the form that you put on the base to keep it together, um, what do you do to create a structure to hold that pipe in there so you have these floating heads it's really cool yes the um it's not always successful and um i've i've tried different things i tend to use a hardwood peg so i buy an mm -hmm. expensive oak rod so that i can literally shape it so it fits into the bottom like a cork okay oh. And so um, you can see that I have actually two holes there because um, when this is bone dry is when I'm drilling this. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> the first hole didn't sit right, so I had to drill a second one. <laughs> and um, so I, I look at museum mounts all the time. Mm -hmm. um, one of the reasons why I did this is um, when I was at uh, – I want to say it's the Getty, um, the J. Paul Getty. They have all their classic Greek heads, you know, all the ones that are broken off, and they're all on these posts. And I just thought that was such a, a yeah. beautiful installation. Um, and that's why I've done it. I know some people use the acrylic, mm -hmm. but um, I'm a little bit heavy handed for acrylic and keeping it polished and, and pretty. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, this is. Um, so the concrete is poured into a concrete tube that I buy at the hardware store. And what I do is I cut the concrete tube to about twice the height that I plan to um, pour in there. I pour the concrete in there. And then once the concrete's set up, I peel it off so that I can finish the edge before the concrete gets really hard. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and then I... I I literally stain the um, concrete with the wood stain. I use paint for a while, but the wood stain absorbs into it really well. And um, I got to tell you, like, I've learned a lot about wood stain because I, I, you know, I always used it where you wipe it on and wipe it off and that's it. But it actually works pretty good as a, a paint. Mm. Uh, some of it does. The water-based stuff is pretty good. Yeah, it dries well, but... But yeah, that's how this is done. Um, literally sanding it down until um, it's a cork. I do have a wood planer that I've used on some of them. 
uh, to shave it down a little bit faster, but they all fit uh, like a cork. And then um, for those, for um, I used metal for a while. Mm -hmm. And what I would do is um, take, um, do you know, uh, it's, it's called Great Stuff. It's a spray foam. Yeah. I would spray it into the head and then stick it onto the metal post after that um, kind of stiffened up. But I had one of those metal posts poke through the top of yeah, one of the heads. Oh. Yeah. And so um, I know, um, I, think, I think Tip Tolan uses some of that spray foam as well um, with some of her, um, with some of her interiors, but um, yeah, it's kind of a puzzle. I'm I'm always so locked into building things that sometimes I forget how I'm going to present them. <laughs> yeah, it's it's something that I always kind of struggle with because I build like I have this idea in my head, and then you get to it, and it's slightly floating or too heavy here or there, and that's a really cool floating apparatus. So yeah, and well, thank you, and and a lot has to do with to like the way that the base is built and allowing that thickness to be there. So when I bisque fire these, I bisque fire them really slow. Mm -hmm. uh, because after all the time that goes in, I don't want to crack it. I don't want to blow it up. Um, you know, the moment you think I'm done blowing up stuff, you're going to blow it <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, in fact, do you remember George, George? I have a George Rodriguez story if you want to hear it. Oh, sure. Do you know the cat that he had at Bellevue Art Museum for the longest time, right at the entrance? Yes. Yeah. Well, there used to be a base for that. And when, so he made that at, at Green River and fired it there. And uh, the base blew up. <laughs> That's why there's no base to it. <laughs> but but it's, it's one of those things. We all blow up stuff. Mm -hmm. And... Um, that cat didn't need, you know, his cat didn't really need it. Um, I thought it looked better without it anyway. Um, but uh, I, on a program, one of the things, so when I learned how to fire electric kiln was in the good old manual days. Mm. And um, you know how you would wind that timer all the way to 20 hours when you were done or pretty close when you do a bisque fire? Well, I, it was Akio who showed me how to do the uh, the uh, the program. He gave me a hard time because he goes, I was in grad school. He goes, I thought you knew how to fire a kiln. I go, I do. Give me a gas kiln, I'll bisque fire. But I don't know about this computer stuff. <laughs> so I had to get a pencil and paper. Um, but after I bisque fired, I realized that the runtime, because back in the day, everybody had manual kilns and the computer was on the wall. Right. The runtime on the kiln for a 26 hour firing was something like four or six, four or five hours mm -hmm. of actual runtime on the, the run clock. And so I had no qualms about um, this firing this for 35 hours on the computer. I basically will hold it at uh, 180 mm -hmm. for um, uh, 10 hours, you know, and then excuse me, I'll go to 150 for about 10 hours and then 180 for about 10 hours mm -hmm. and then go 100 degrees an hour um, uh, and pause at quartz aversion and then up to, to Kono 4. Uh, after quartz, I pretty much go like 250 uh, an hour um, on up and it ends up being a, you know, a 30 hour, 29, 30 hour firing sometimes. And but some of this is about two and a half inches thick. Whoa. Yeah. yeah. Like, uh, um, like some people, when they build, they build really light. Mm -hmm. I, I, my pots get light, but my, my sculpture, uh, you know, it's not very, very light. And um, so, you know, if you're, if you, if you're getting to that, that area of being this thick, it's going to need to dehydrate um, and then doing things like poking holes on the inside if you can. Some of those old school things really help. Um, I don't know if you're shown that in sculpture, but you know, where you poke holes with a, uh, a skewer and then you smooth it out on the outside, that helps um, evaporate moisture if you have to fire faster. 
but um, but you know when I I bisque in my propane the kiln in my backyard's propane, and so I bisque everything in gas um, I, at home, and uh, you know that's I basically spend one day bringing it up to about um, uh, 200 degrees. I hold it there for for that day, and then I turn off the kiln at night. And then I start it up the next morning, and I'll be done um, with that bisque by dinner time, basically, um, allowing it. So I kind of heat it up to get all that water out because we live in the Northwest. Things, yeah. thick clay really holds on to that moisture. And even if your if your kiln is outside, your bricks gonna absorb moisture as well. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. I know when I look at Val Cushing's. A graph for bisque firing, I think <laughs> his pots must be really thin. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do very slow bisques um, at school as well. And uh, it's just because there are so many different types of work being produced. Yeah. And it's always best to err on the side of caution. You yeah. know, it's, it's no fun to blow up someone's work. You know, That's it's no fun blowing up your own, but it's really no fun blowing up somebody else's. Especially somebody's first cup or yeah. somebody's first sculpture. Yeah. That they're, they're, they came to school early to see, and then you're like, oh, well, we had an accident. <laughs> um, uh, I remember, um, since we're telling stories, I, yes. I remember blowing up um, one of my students sculptural pieces final project and he sculpted like a, you know a, a a foot that turned into a tree um you know from the ankle up and stuff awesome and and it just i mean it wasn't because of the firing necessarily it was a lot to do with the construction method he was laying wet clay on dry clay and and um Anyway, lots and lots of pieces. And uh, I opened it up on, you know, I I don't know what day it was. Anyway, I opened it up and, and I saw these pieces. And I thought, oh, God. I spent about eight hours gluing that thing together. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, that so and I, I, re, I, I uh, took photographs of the whole process of reconstructing this piece. And when it came in, I said, I'm really sorry, you know, I did this, but, but I put it back together for you. Um, and uh, I said, you know, paint it with acrylics. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. And it was probably way cooler than it would have been otherwise, because it <laughs> came out great. It yeah. really came out great. That's awesome. <laughs> But yeah. that's the thing, you never know, you know, sometimes you can make something out of, uh, out of, out of a disaster or what seems like a disaster at first. Yeah. Well, I knew he wasn't going to put that kind of time into <laughs> repairing it. I'm sure he would have just broke down seeing all these shards. Yeah. I kind of like yeah. doing that, uh, restoring pieces like that yeah. anyway. So oh, yeah. it was it was uh, a labor of love, I I would say. <laughs> a collaboration. Well, that turned into one. He ended up with the piece. I I would have loved to have had that. It was it. Yeah. it but I got photographs. So that's uh, awesome. That is so cool. <laughs> well, I know I um, you know, like I said, you're never done blowing up stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, so be careful with those thick sculptures. And I was going to say a lot of times when I go to the museums and I see sculpture that's similar to mine, I will look at how they're mounted. Mm -hmm. um, uh, like Sam has some pretty good wall mounting solutions. You don't get to look behind it really, but you get a sense that some, they, they have a fabricator somewhere. And so if you know somebody who, who can weld, um, that's really helpful. Um, I used to have access to a welder um, at the UW, but I don't anymore. And uh, you know, it was kind of nice to be able to have things uh, custom made. Um, I've always liked um, pots that have round bottoms, and it's nice to have that s kind of circular yeah. metal structure for it to rest on. Yeah. Um, and uh, um, the thing is that circle has to be perfectly symmetrical. 
Um, otherwise a pot doesn't sit right on it. And to, to find a welder that knows how to make those circles can be um, tough. But uh, anyway, or weld the legs the same length and all that. Um, but if you can find somebody who does that for you, that, that can be really helpful. And uh, yeah, so anyway, it's sure good talking with you guys tonight. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, it's been Thank great. Thank you so much. Yeah. That was really lovely. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, I guess, um, I guess we'll say goodbye, Paul. Uh, okay. Again, I really appreciate this. It's been awesome, awesome yeah. talking to you. It's been great and, to uh, see you and meet you guys. And, uh, <laughs> keep up the clay work. You know, um, I don't. I don't know if you guys know who Jerry Saltz is, but uh, oh yeah, oh yeah. god yeah. Well, he did the closing ceremony or opening ceremony in Kansas City. I can't yeah. remember if it was opening or closing, but it was great. Yes, and he. One of the things that that uh, caught my attention that he said is that um, the greatest resistance to you know like how it doesn't feel like you always have support as an artist. The greatest way to express that resistance is by continuing to make. Not, mm -hmm. and not only making art, but, but then going and seeing art and then celebrating the victories of, of those you know who are also making art. Going, and, um, going to their shows and seeing their openings because when you see one or two pieces by themselves, um, that's great. But when you see the, the collective uh, exhibition of their work, you really get a, a breath of what their ideas are that I think is really um, profound. And I think, well, well, it inspires me. It makes me want to go home and work, right? Like, <laughs> um, and uh, a few years ago, I was reminded of, it, um, oh, I'm trying to think of his name. <laughs> his name escapes me. I can tell I'm getting tired. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he teaches out of Arizona. He makes those porcelain uh, kind of cloud shapes that with geometric. Oh, uh, uh, Sam Chung. Sam Chung, uh, and uh, I had seen, I would see one of his pots here, one of his pots there, and I thought they were cool, but I really didn't understand what they were doing. And then he did a solo show at Gallery Ema, and I was just blown away by those pieces uh. collectively there is such a stronger message coming from uh from from that work than it by itself that really um was inspiring so if i was to leave you with anything it would be to to make work and go see art and um and enjoy it <laughs> all right <laughs> awesome yeah all right you guys have a good night okay thanks a lot thanks yeah. again paul all right take care you guys checks in the mail Oh, no worries. <laughs> Bye, you guys. It was fun. <laughs> Bye.